So, my topic is, I'm coming from the physics department, and in physics department my responsibility is physics teacher education, and that's uh, why we have been led to think about conceptualization, concept formation, how students learn concepts. And one way to understand or clarify us how it actually happens and how students build up meaning of the physics concepts is to use a network kind of representations of students' conceptual knowledge. This work is done in collaboration with Maya Mopsi and my postdoc in physics department and based on a collection of certain networks collected from students representing the students' understanding uh, especially concepts in electricity and magnetism. And there are some resemblances of this kind of thinking with what Timo just presented about formation of meaning of concepts, the linguistic nets, networks, semantic networks. But there are also some differences which are made in to <coughs> certain practical approach on the problem. What we need to do is to understand the practice of students' knowledge building. And this means that several things can't be done very, very rigorously. We need to simplify simplify certain things. And as Timo mentioned, uh, there's a big difference what we can do by hand, what we can do by machine. And here we have combined uh, manual interpretation, the human interpreter has interpreted many things in student reports, student expressions. Then we build a network and try to figure out how actually students link these concepts they are studying as, as a network and as a holistic, holistic network. So the problem of interest which we address is how teacher students actually construct their declarative knowledge of physics concepts. You can understand that this is very important for the teachers because teachers need to be able to explain these things to students to give a verbal exposition of the knowledge he or she is teaching in a classroom. In a sense, good teacher is good making logical arguments, making coherent arguments presenting the conceptual material in the verbal way. Well, if we think physics concepts, especially let's take for example the concept of electric field, which we have studied to some extent, very often the students think that electric field, for example, can be defined in some way, that there is a kind of dictionary definition for the electric field, or we can give a short sentences which clarify what electric field actually is. But as already Thomas Kuhn mentioned that physics concepts, probably not any other concepts either, are not like this. The concepts obtain meaning or get their meaning from, from the context of using these concepts. There is a certain space, a certain context where these concepts can be, can be applied and concepts can have different kind of projected meanings in different kind of contexts. And this is sometimes very difficult for the students to understand. That there is no simple way to define a physics concept. No more electric field than electron or concept of mass. We need to know a certain set of examples, exemplars, where this concept can be applied, how it can, how it can be applied. It's not only declarative knowledge, it's also procedural knowledge, how to use the concepts. But <clears throat> this of course raises the question or problem how to get access, how students think about the concepts. And in this study, the context is third and fourth year university students, pre-service teachers, in a teacher education course, duration is seven weeks, we have two of such courses focusing on the physics conceptual structure and how concepts evolve in physics for the purposes of teaching physics. And they do a certain set of semi-structured 
tasks, where they do concept mapping, and also write study reports about how they think physics concepts can be introduced and how they get meaning, for example, to certain experiments or certain models. And what they actually do is that they try to link the most common textbook representations, for example, a physics experiments where electric field is used or where electric field is uh, somehow making an appearance or is used as an interpretation or where the electric field becomes a measurable physics quantity. And similar thing with a certain mathematical models the textbooks present, how electric field can be used in different problems to explain the situation and what properties in, in a certain phenomena electric field explains and clarifies. And then gradually building a network of different, different experiments, different models, also different mathematical definitions and conceptual definitions, the students build up a network which gradually becomes more extensive and extensive. And in, in a simple sense, the more extensive this network becomes, the more things the students can link to these concepts and more meaning these concepts. At say. Of course, now very important thing in this, this way of doing things is that the students must be able to justify the connection. If they think that, for example, let's say electric field is somehow connected to a certain experiment, let's say cold experiment, they need to justify their thinking. They need to carefully say what kind of statements, knowledge claims they are made making, what, what is measurable in this experiment, how the measurements are interpreted so that it justifies uh, these knowledge claims. Actually, we have resolved uh, four steps of different epistemic levels, levels uh, how the students need to justify their thinking. So, if they can't do it, they can't represent the connection. <coughs> so, in a sense, all these connections are, to a certain degree, epistemic justified. Connections. And this seems to make a big difference between the students. Some students are not so good in making the, the justifications. For example, roughly perhaps one third of the teacher students are able to give a complete, adequate argument which is logically coherent. It's only one third of these students. Other students, they always know the basic facts, but when they need to explain the details, for example, the experiment or the model, how it's done actually, then it begins to be a bit more difficult for many students and very difficult in the level when, when complete logical justification is, is needed. The complete uh, logical justification actually technically means that the argument can be represented in the form presented by Stephen Turney in his famous book of argumentation where uh, different parts of the argument are disintegrated and, and analyzed in detail. So that's very difficult for the students. But as you can understand, it's very important for teachers to be able to reach this stage because teaching without a coherent argumentation, coherent logic is fascinating. Here is one example of the maps the students have constructed. These nodes here, they mostly represent either physics concepts or simple physics laws, relations between the concepts. And then part of these nodes represent models and experiments, which are named experiments, named models usually, those models and experiments the standard physics textbooks are dealing with. And then these uh, links here, every link represents a certain procedure. So either a link is a definition, it can be an operative, operational relation of the concept, it can be a measurement, interpretation of the measurement, or graphical representation of the data. So the link represents something which can be done. So in, in a sense, this network contains not only declarative knowledge, 
of the possible conceptual connections, it contains also procedural knowledge in, in certain simple level of operations which can be done when one makes a progress from a certain node to another node. Most extensive maps or this kind of network representations the students construct, they contain, if I remember correctly, 57 nodes and 120 leads. And this seems to be this seems to be somehow the front edge the, the most capable students can perform. Actually, Timo mentioned this Vygotsky's proximal zone of development and we have interpreted this edge to represent this Vygotsky's proximal zone of development of the most competent students. When the instructors did a similar kind of exercise, the map produced by the instructor was much more extensive. It contained nearly 100 concepts and 200 links. So there was a gap between the, what students could do and what the, the instructors could do. And, well, that's good, I think. <laughs> so now this is the map the students, students produce. They do it in, in collaboration in small groups. But basically, every student finalizes the map him or herself alone. So, none of these maps are, are exactly similar to some other map. And when we started to do this kind of exercises some, some 10 years ago for the first time, one problem was to tell which representation is good one, which representation is not so good one, what kind of differences there are in the representations because just by simply looking at these, these maps it's very difficult to make any difference between different maps. You can see that yes, they are different, but in what way different? It's, it's difficult. And that's why we, we gradually try to find ways to quantify more more analytically, what is actually represented in this kind of maps. And the first step is a kind of classification of the concepts in a very simple way, so that when the students uh, represents a certain uh, physics concept, term or law, we then decide whether it's just conceptual meaning that there is no experiment, no model connected, so it can be just a conceptual definition, one concept with the help of some other concepts. But then some of these uh, nodes are clearly models, mathematical <coughs> models or modeling, and some of the nodes are experiments. And the model nodes are <coughs> denoted by M, and the experiment nodes by E, and then these conceptual nodes which is not so clearly defined class, uh, it just C. And then we number all these concepts, what we have found in, in the collection of student maps. So we agglomerate all the maps and see what kind of uh, collection of different concepts or items there are and number all these items so that, for example, Uncle Maxwell law is always number 113. Okay, this is, this is a kind of formalization of the content of the maps. Uh, then what we do next is that we build up an uh, adjacency matrix which represents this complex network. So each, complex, uh, each, each uh, concept is a node in a network and we produce a matrix representation. There is a one one trick which needs to be done because these networks are weighted networks. Each of these links receives a weight representing how well justified the link is. You remember that I mentioned that we have this four level uh, classification or categorization of the epistemic level. The lowest level represents one and the highest level four. We scale these numbers from zero to one and get the link weight. So, what we have is actually that we have a node here, 
another node here the nodes themselves also have weights following the same epistemic classification so these nodes have also strengths representing how well the content of the node is justified, just, just, justified. and then we also have this link from one node to another node also having a weight from 0 to 1 and now of course we can see that if, if this is strong this is strong and this is strong we have a, a strong directed connection between two nodes but if this is zero the connection is nearly non-existent so to make things easier because these uh, networks are directed we remove the weights of the nodes and put everything on the weight of the link so that the new link has a weight which is a multiplication of all these weights in, in different uh, items or entities in this original network this is done for the simplicity because it's a bit cumbersome to deal with networks where nodes and links are weighted it's easier to handle weighted networks and then we produce the aliasensing matrix which represents all possible links between the, between the nodes well, now, when, when we have this uh, analysis matrix, we can uh, take the initial network, have a tag on each node, each node have a tag, whether it is conceptual model or experiment. And we can split the network in sub-networks, either containing only conceptual elements, either containing experimental elements or model elements and see how these connections keep changing when when we take one of these tagged subnetworks. And then we are ready to actually define or make more clear what concepts in the student networks are the most important concepts. If we think about this requirement that concept should have a meaning which is well connected to other meanings in the network one very obvious way is this idea of coherence for example the uh, science philosophers dealing with the coherence theory of knowledge have suggested that these cyclical connections in, in the conceptual network or belief network is a sign of certain kind of coherence between the concepts this is only one of them but then, coherence is it's not only one property we are interested in, also the contingency is, is important property. You can think that when a teacher starts with a certain concept and wants to introduce a, let's say, third concept, he or she may find connections between these concepts but it's also possible that this third concept is attainable in a certain very straightforward logical path and then we can have different paths on that concept more we have the paths, more we have contingency in, in this kind of network. Actually, one of these coherence theories of knowledge, Schreuber, sorry, not Schreuber, Schreuber, <laughs> Schreuber has uh, claimed that typical characteristic features of the scientific knowledge are actually coherence and contingency, more or less in this, this sense. This is a huge simplification, but still it contains 
some notions of how our scientific knowledge needs to be connected. So we take this coherence and contingency so that coherence is a kind of cyclical measure, contingency is a kind of branching path measure for, for the structure of this network. Here some uh, formalized examples of these reduced idealized networks when they are as, as network theorists say, spring embedded, meaning that each of these links is imagined to be a, a spring, and then the total energy of the system is minimized, but the total energy of the system is maximized. So that the tightly, tightly knit part of the network is in the center of the network. It gives a kind of visual idea which part of the networks are, are interesting and important. Okay, but now going to measuring these kind of properties of coherence and contingency. Of course, one reason we choose these measures is that we can oper operationalize these measures by using the network theory. We can count all these possible paths between different nodes. It's the, the first line over there. And it counts actually, actually the connected nodes and if we select, you see here is the index P, Q. If we select same indexes, the diagonal part of the adjacency matrix, we get the cyclic parts. And now, when the length of the path increases, first we have the path of, of length 1, length 2, length 3, and so on and so on. When it increases, also the combination of the paths increases, so we just divide the counting of the path by the factorial of the path. This is a very simple choice and it can be justified to some degree and the benefit is that then we get a series which sums up to exponential function. So the nice property of the, of the model is that you can quite well define an exponential of the adjacency matrix and do the counting in, in well-ordered mathematical way. Then the, the line in the middle represents the cyclical paths, uh, these, or the or total weight of all the cyclical paths, giving you a global measure of the coherence. How coherently a certain node is connected as one of the coherent. And this last one is is measure of this branching part for the contingency, giving a measure of how contingent a certain concept is in, in the hidden network. Now, both these properties need to be uh, important if the concept of is of importance, and then we just define a geometric average of these two properties and call it the importance and can then do ranking of the concepts in the student's network on the basis how, how important a certain concept in the network is. The importance ranking is, is very uh, commonly used in bibliographic measurements where a certain article or its importance, for example, is measured on the basis how well it's cited by other articles. So, in, in a sense, this is nothing new to define such an importance measure. But then, if you now think what we have here, we have transformed a single student network to measures of importance. It, let's say that it has 50 concepts. We have 50 values for the importance of this, each 50 concepts. And we have actually a vector of dimension 50. Now, if two students happen to have exactly same importances for each of these concepts, the, the networks are similar. So, degree we are interested in the similarity of the network. But this never happens. There are only certain concepts which are more important than the others, but, but it never happens so that, that the vectors are so close to each other that, for example, taking the, the ordinary cosine 
cosine uh, criteria for the similarity of the vectors would produce anything intelligible. Then what we did is that well we taught how to generalize <laughs> this this cosine cri criteria and. Um, Fortunately, mathematicians have this nice construct of p norm, uh, which is a generalization of the ordinary norm on which the cosine criteria is, is based. But now you can tune it by using a different values of p so that those concepts which have an importance close to one are given more weight. And actually, this stabilizes in, in a certain values of p so that when p is from 4 to 8 the results no more change and we get a nice representation representation of those concepts which are the most important ones and the similarity comparison can be based then on this p model. How it looks like is that well, perhaps some first pre preliminary, preliminary data. There is the degree of the node, how it is distributed, and here is the importance of the node, nodes, how they are distributed. These are important concepts here, and we need to pick up these concepts. Here are some examples of, of these important connections in different cases, and here is a kind of plot which shows where we find these nodes. For example, node 28 has a very high contingency in many of the networks. It also has a very high coherence in many of the networks. So apparently it's a very important, important concept. But this looks very messy. It's, it's difficult. It contains all the information, but it looks very messy. We need to represent it more conveniently. And this is what we did. This is part of the spectrogram or fingerprint of each student network so that one student network is represented as a stripe here. And darker the dot on this stripe, the higher is the importance ranking of the concept in, in that network. And then you can see that in many of the student graphs, concept 27 is always important, also 83, and so on and so on. But there is a lot of variation in, in these individual networks. But st this helps to figure out where the similarities are and how we can recognize the similarities. And fortunately, these important concepts are also meaningful in physical sense. The important concepts are, for example, electric field, magnetic field, superposition of electric fields, energy conservation, and so on and so on. But there are many individual differences. Here, finally, is the comparison of the similarity uh, where this P norm is calculated for the networks. The networks are here. Uh, this diagonal is black because, of course, each network is self similar to itself. But then you can see certain blocks here where you find very similar networks. In the uppermost picture, you have all the tags conceptual model experiments. Here you have only the experiments and here you have only, only the models. There are some slight differences and the tendency seems to be that on basis of the models the networks are more similar than on basis of the experiments. <coughs> Which is probably explained quite easily that most textbooks deal more with models than they do with experiments. So, the similarity is inherited from the similarity of the textbooks. But eventually, this kind of classification of the meaning of the nodes, importance ranking, measuring the, the kind of conceptual dimensions of the node, and using the network theoretic methods has allowed us to do a certain kind of content analysis of these student networks quite flexibly 
and, and it has also been useful in practice. Although we don't base the evaluation of the students of the course grades in this kind of, this kind of analysis. If you are more interested about the details, there is a there is a publication where these things are explained in more detail in the global context. Okay, I'm finished.